You're listening to Death of the Reader, Flex and Herds here for your Murder Mystery World Tour. And welcome to the start of a brand new old book, Oh, Absolution by Murder. <sighs> by Peter Tremaine, aka Peter Beresford Ellis. I don't really know a lot about this book, Herds, but I was <laughs> kind of surprised to see this as your, uh, as your pick. I've been looking for like a medieval or pre-medieval murder mystery. This one's set in 664, so the the Dark Ages, which we know nothing about except that it was night all the time. Um, (laughs) Don't laugh at that. That's a bad joke. It's like every history teacher's joke who I've ever learned with. I picked The Absolution by Murder. This is the first book in the uh, Sister Fidelma murder mystery series by Peter Tremaine. And I picked it because the 33rd book in this series is coming out later this year, and I wanted to oh, give us a crash course in this uh, this this author's work. That's more than one book a year since this came out in ninety four. Yes. That's a that's a solid effort. Yeah, no, it's incredible. And, and he's a historian on top of this. How does a man have the time? I don't know. I assume he leads a double or triple life in order to get everything done. I was going to suggest cloning, but I guess that's a bit beyond the realms of the Celtic history that we're dealing with here. Maybe his second life is is his future self. He studies the future. Oh, that's crazy. And that's how he can clone himself. <laughs> Let's get away from this. This is terrible. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> a murder happens alongside this real historical yes. event in the Synod of Whitby in Northumbria, as mm-hmm. Herds mentioned. Yeah, and the point of this synod, which is just like a Christian gathering, is to determine how monks' hair should be styled and cut, uh, and also when Easter should be held. There's some uh, deliberation between the churches of Ireland and Rome, which is why when we get into the meat and potatoes of this murder mystery, we have two detectives. Sister yeah. Fildolma is the, the protagonist. Her name's on the cover and everything. Mm-hmm. She's from Ireland, of course. Uh, she teams up with a Saxon uh, by the name of Brother Edolf. I did enjoy their first run-in in the book. They kind of like just pass each other in the hall. They lock and eyes. Up until that point in the book, I'd been like, has Herds even picked a murder <laughs> mystery here? What's happening? It's my perfect book. And then when they get paired up, because of course, Fidelma says, I'll take on the murder mystery by myself because I'm an independent woman who don't need no man. And they have like a almost philosophical discussion where they talk about how they should split up the work and who should lead. And they say, well, maybe we can both lead at the same time. It's incredible. (laughs) It's such a good sequence. I'm like, you two need to get together, which is okay at this point in history. It's okay in this time, as we say in the author's notes, where there's perfectly highlighted lots uh, lots of cohabitation, con hospitae or double houses. I love that there is a historical note, which is, it's just here to say, guess what? Sex between the monks. It's cool guys. And here's my romantic couple. Coincidence? I just want to say, Herds, me being me, I feel Mm. like the book had done its own mystery in by that historical note. Ah. But I'm not going to, I'm going to save that for next week's theory. I got (laughs) to, I got to cook something else up this week. Look, I'm not going to try and lead you anywhere. I don't want to get in the mystery, at least Mm. until we're done with this preamble, you know, all this good stuff. But there is a certain level of density to this book. There is. That really makes the murder mystery elements stick out so much. We spend so long <sighs> learning about- Names. Like, <laughs> Ulfrith and Athelnoth yes. and Eild. Like in one paragraph, we list all of the following names. Ulfrith, Ryanfelt, <laughs> uh, Wolfric, Wolfred, Fidelma, uh, Cinnabar, Penda, <laughs> Aflid, Alfrith, there, there are just so many phonetically overlapping names. Don't forget the best character, Kanna, son of Kanna, who is just a crazy beggar guy. He's like, <laughs> blood will pour from the steeples of the abbey. And there will be death. It's great. He kind of like does it again. He does it again. During the synod. This is something that people online have negatively reviewed the book mm. for. The fact that that Peter is obsessed with like, pushing the Irish as being far more progress- uh, progressive than the Romans and the Saxons, <laughs> which I really enjoy. Every single time someone's like, I don't like listening to women. Fidelman's like, well, actually in Ireland, we we love that. That's like the, the most basic thing. You should know how to do this. And someone's like, you don't have the authority to question these laws. You're like, actually, I do. 
I'm a, yeah. a Dali. I, a doll like a know, lawyer. She's a lawyer. She's a lawyer. She's a lawyer detective. And according to the ancient laws of Ireland, she's allowed to question kings. And Fidelma is just coming in and saying like, well, you know, these are all the things I need to investigate the case yeah. and here's what needs to be done. And Hilda's standing there like shocked and horrified so that anyone is demanding something of her king. And the king's just having a having a laugh about it because he's like, yep, this is just what they're like in Ireland. Babe. That scene is so good. It ends with with Hilda saying, you know, it's like pairing up a fox and a wolf to catch a hare. And Oswe says- I wonder which you think is the fox and which is the wolf. <laughs> he gets it. The man gets yeah. it. And I love him. I think he might be my favorite character in the book. Yeah, he's he's really compelling in like the few scenes that we get of him. But yeah. he's so obviously consigned to the background in a yes, lot of scenes. Yes, well, he's a real person. So yeah. it's a bit tricky, isn't it? This... I, I feel the reaches for like a different level of immersion because of how specifically in this one event with yep. all of these characters dealing with this actual like flashpoint in history. You really have to focus in and, and pull out the characters from fiction that, that matter. I did want to raise one thing though about the like historical side oh. of this though. Just because like sure. it's so dense, it explains so many things in the world building and it yep. also has this like bizarre integration of like classic language yes, in yes. with modern English dialogue. There is definitely a sense that when we use words like I am the domina of this, this mm. abbey or this particular branch of the abbey. I'm like, you could have just said mistress. Like that's the same. It's just yeah. feminine form of master. And I think that he, Peter here is trying to include as much as he thinks he can get away with. Right. Probably more than he can realistically get away with at some well, exactly. points. Let's be honest. For sure. But it is kind of interesting, that idea that fiction of made up places and like reimaginings of real place in history aren't that far apart fictionally. Mm, sure. Like this has such a distinct feel of like trying to recreate this real place, yeah. but not quite being able to because of the limits of its audience. Yeah. Uh, is something that I find really interesting as a reader and probably one of the things that pulled me through the density of that historical information because <laughs> it, yep. it definitely meanders because of it. I do want to say, to defend Peter here, because I have yeah. to. Look, I'm the history guy. I'm the romantic guy. I have to defend this book. That's how it is. Please, please. Um, the paragraph that you mentioned earlier where we discuss the family and children of Oswe is yeah. delivered by a character by the name of, of Brother Taran, who yes. is explicitly like kind of a nerd. Yeah, he basically just kind of serves as like a translator for Fidelma because she isn't particularly good at understanding Saxon. It's true, but it is also to demonstrate that Brother Taran never shuts up. <laughs> like it, it, it illuminates something about his character. Yeah. So it's not like reading an actual historical document where we just get a list of names and dates. We are learning things about the characters. It's just that you can sometimes forget that when you're reading all those names and dates. Interestingly, I think a lot of the classical history that I have read sure. isn't just names and dates, though. And I mm. feel that's also something that Peter was going for with this story sure. so far, is that aside from the modern perspective-based writing that mm. we get here, you know, a lot of this is very much in the historical nature of embedding the history within a narrative. Yeah, with characters that can comment on it and illustrate. Yeah. Like, Fidelma more or less represents all of Ireland, you yeah. know? And and Idolf is supposed to represent uh, a slightly more forward-thinking version mm. of Rome, of Christian Rome around this time. Um, yeah. Though he is a Saxon, obviously. And there's there's a lot of mention of like the poetry and literature of the time. We go, don't get to see a lot of it at its face value, but there's obviously mm. nods there yeah. to the way the history was conveyed through means other than just direct account. Mm, for um, sure. You know, and, and I think that's clearly part of why Wilfred appears as a character in this story, as well as his actual attendance in history. I think that the the details we've been given about the mystery, the fact that we've got a physical person seeing people yeah. going going back and forth in the chamber, and apparently she knew exactly when the body was found because she has flowing water and she can tell what the time is by how much water is flowing, whatever <laughs> it is. 
Um, what a bizarre it's, thing. I mean, it's a real thing. It's a, it's a thing that Greeks invented. The thing that's bizarre about it is how blatantly it just is a murder mystery device. It's like, oh, yeah, the character who was wearing a watch. <laughs> you could have just used the eclipse that occurred. You could have just said, at the time of the eclipse, she was killed. Yes. Like, you could have just said that and it would mm-hmm. have been fine. But instead, we're taking the opportunity to illuminate a piece of, of Greek invention mm-hmm. that is, like, cool and interesting. Shout it's, out to it, Vasim Khan. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> it, it really shows the priorities of, of Peter as he's writing this novel. And I kind mm-hmm. of enjoy how how blatant his intentions are. I, I have nothing but respect, you know? Absolutely. Anyhow, we should uh, close this bit of the discussion off. We'll be back at the end of the show to talk more Uh-oh. about that same mystery. You're listening to Death of the Reader, your murder mystery world tour here on 2SER. We are discussing Absolution by Murder, chapters 1 to 7 by Peter Tremaine. And we'll be back with more of that in just a second. You're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex here with you. Harini Nagendra is a professor of sustainability at Azim Premji University in Bangalore, India, where she leads the university's Center for Climate Change and Sustainability. Before joining our world, she's written extensively on urban ecology, forest conservation, with titles like Nature in the City, Bengaluru in the Past, Present, and Future. But her debut crime fiction novel is The Bangalore Detectives Club, which has just come out in the past week. We're fortunate enough to get the chance to speak with her ahead of it. This is from a few weeks ago when I had freshly read the novel. And let's uh, pass over to past me and Harini. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Felix. I'm really pleased to be here. I have to get this out the gate, first of all. What convinced you to make the jump from writing about conservation to crime fiction? (laughs) Okay, so this, I actually thought of writing the fiction work before I started working on the books on conservation. It just took a really long time. Sometime in uh, 2007, so I was pregnant with my daughter and uh, I was sitting at home and looking at something else and preparing for what I would do. And I thought the first three months of a new baby, you know, she's going to sleep all the time. I will have all this time to do something else. Wishful yeah. thinking. So, which is why it took so long. Wishful thinking, very wishful thinking. Right. And so the main character, Kaveri, she dropped into my head, except she had a different name. Her name was Bhagirati. Then. But she popped into my head, ready, fleshed out and just wanted me to write about her. And it was the weirdest thing. And so I thought, yeah, in all my innocence, that I would get this done during the first three months. But it, then it took time. And so the, now the baby is now 14 and she's an active beta reader of my books and gives me a lot of critiques and comments. And so it took a while. Uh, my first fiction, my first nonfiction book was published in 2015. But this idea of the fiction book, Kaveri book, started in 2007. Yeah, I really liked, I guess, the way then that you open the novel, because in the same way that Kaveri has been with you for so long, we almost get a jump ahead in her life before the story actually begins. We kind of see where things have ended up, the shed with the label, the Bangalore Detectives Club, before that's even begun. Why open the novel with that flash forward when it's not necessarily intricately linked with specifically the mystery side of things. So actually, that's it's, it's interesting that you asked because that actually came at the end of the book. And it came when we were close to getting to the copy editing stage. Because what happened is we jump in, but it's it's a slow, as you'll see, it's a slow beginning. You know, the murder doesn't come till a few chapters in. And so we were kind of looking back at this book and thinking, if someone reads this book, are they going to know it's a murder? We, we called it the Bangalore Detectives Club. Presumably, there's something they're going to detect. But the detection comes in a few chapters later. So we mm. wanted people to know that, you know, this is where it ends up. So this is sort of a glimpse to say, okay, this is where we're going. Please stay with us on this journey for the first three, four chapters. And then we'll get there. It's it's really good, too, because I was thinking about that when I began the first chapter. Like, how would it have been different without the prologue there? Mm. And I don't, I don't think that the journey is necessarily any different but i was so hooked by this stranger showing up in the opening chapter so it just goes to show the powerful things that can come through copy editing shout out to copy editors <laughs> absolutely now one of the other interesting details that i thought was really unique about the novel was that you referenced at some point in this novel baroness orxy who is often either forgotten or joked about being forgotten in the world of mystery fiction what drew you to using her as an inspiration for Kaveri's character i love 
old detective books and in the older the better and i love ones written by women because i just think they're very powerful and so and i love baroness oxy i mean i just scarlet pimpernel was such an influence for me in school my library had a really old dusty copy that was falling apart so i wanted to bring her in somehow and i do have sherlock holmes but i wanted a woman writer and all the other classic golden age women writers and they're writing about a time which is the time of the book itself yeah i mean i guess we were speaking with academic ankita rathua recently about how women in stories kind of have to take other avenues for access to information so they can be detectives and i thought that you know having work like baroness orxy's there to kind of frame and set up the inspirations for how kaveri goes about that is you know so much fun because there is a huge history to that beyond just you know the miss marple which i think is the one that everyone would know in the murder mystery world exactly yes and i mean her books are just amazing so i just it was also playing paying homage to her right? yeah i guess speaking of that like access to information how important do you think luck is to a detective because there are so many moments that vary throughout this novel I, I don't want to say that she's there purely because of luck, because she kind of creates her own luck by going where she shouldn't be. But there's also so many just circumstances where she's right next to where the information happens to be at the right time. Is that part of luck or is that part of creating it for herself, do you think? I think it's serendipity. I mean, if I think of a lot of the things, I, I ended up in ecology because of serendipity. I ended up working on cities because of serendipity. And none of these were sort of planned turns in my life. It's or I just started writing this book because of serendipity, because mm. Kaveri came into my head. So for me, she's very much a character who works with serendipitious movements. So she makes her own luck, but she's also, I mean, she's open to the universe, let me say. There's, there's uh, something that I read once, which uh, influenced me a lot. It said, you know, I was sitting at home waiting for good fortune to show up and fortune knocked in my door and I opened the door and I said, go away. I'm looking for fortune. Yeah. I mean, compared to a lot of other Indian groundbreakers that we've seen in the novels we've been covering, I felt Kaveri was a lot more concerned with the expectations placed on her, but also without letting them get in the way. How do you think she can be so effective at both? I think women did, you know, in reality, they navigated and they were so good at navigating all of these. I think of my aunts, my grandparents, mother, my husband's aunt, who was actually one of the inspirations for Kaveri going swimming because she went swimming in a sari. And you know, they were always, women were always good at navigating these multiple expectations. So making sure that people, that they didn't defy people openly, mm. that they said yes, and then they went on to do exactly what they wanted. Navigating was an important part of that world, I think. And so to me, that, that's really the world that I saw so many women that generation navigating and that's really so that's why the world that i wanted to put that into the world i suppose the other thing that you mentioned in there was the gardens and the history of you know nature policy natural policy in india at the time for you working in that as an academic is there a feeling for you that you want to kind of get away from that and use it more as a set dressing just show the natural beauty in these crime novels or do you think there's room for you to speak about the natural history in Kaveri's journey as we go forwards I would love to do frankly much more of the natural history of the journey so the first book I the first draft of this book I have to say was heavy with a lot of more like much more natural history and then my <laughs> had, to put, had to put citations for the academic papers at the bottom <laughs> of the page <laughs> and I have a, you know I had a fabulous editor at Little Brown and she's, one of the things first things she said was you know this is really interesting and I'm looking at the botany and I'm loving this and all of these little side discussions but do you think you could get back to the murder mystery a little more a little quicker but to respond to your question I think very much for me the social ecological setting of this book is a, is a character of its own because I think that sets up the contrast between the what the British part of the city was and the Indian part of the city. You know, the British had all these lovely, the large rain trees and the tabubias and the um, jacarandas, which you see in Africa. And the Indians were very much with the smell and the taste and can we cook with it and can we use it in some way? And, and it's a very different view of the city. So the Indian part of the city had the coconut trees and the British often called it a metropolis of monkeys, the Indian parts of the city. So it, there's that contrast I wanted to set up very much around the British parts and the Indian parts. It's the same city. Yeah. But it's 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 really a clash of cultures. All righty. Well, Harini, thank you so much for joining me here on Death of the Reader. It has been a pleasure sharing your novel and welcome to the crime fiction world. Uh, this is a stunning debut and so glad to have you. I absolutely love this, Felix. Thank you so much for this. 
The Bangalore Detectives Club is out now wherever you get your books. And thank you to Pegasus Crime over in the United States for hooking us up with early copies of this one. I had a great time with it and we'll have links up on the podcast to where you can hopefully get yourself a copy. We'll be back with more of Absolution by Murder by Peter Tremaine in just a second. Stick around. You're listening to Death of the Reader. You're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex and Herds here for your Murder Mystery World Tour. We are discussing Absolution by Murder by Peter Tremaine. Chapters 1 to 7. I am in the hot seat. Herds has challenged me to this historical Celtic novel, the first in the Sister Fidelma series. Shout out to Ireland. Oh, Saints Preserva. Shout out to Ireland. Um, <laughs> anyway. Anyway. I think it's more of a warm seat than a hot seat this week, but we'll see. We'll see how you go solving this one. Listen, I feel I feel pretty hot trying to have to come up with an alternate <laughs> yeah. theory for this novel. Because what? You say it's really easy? Or? Listen, as much as I'm enjoying <laughs> reading this book, it seems like Peter was- overconfident in his lack of subtlety. Look, obviously I'm not here to confirm or deny anything. We're only in the (laughs) first week. We have to wait till the third week to talk about how fair or how unfair the mystery is. (laughs) But- Peter, as I mentioned in the first part, he's trying to stick to these murder mystery tropes. I think it's a little too close. Um, mm-hmm. to to prove a significant yeah. challenge for the reader. I'm really hoping alongside these episodes, we get the chance to talk about one of the more modern ones. Hopefully the new one when it comes out, which is in a month after. It's pretty soon. It's in it's in July. So it's pretty mm. soon. Um, I mean, I picked the the first novel because I thought it would be a good place to see Peter yeah. at his his rawest, his writing mm-hmm. as, it, totally. as it is originally. And when he's got that fire, that passion, and I'm excited to see how it's uh, Before you been cultivated. Old and jaded well, for the remaining 32 I mean, books. it it might have happened. <laughs> we don't know. I'm just <laughs> we don't know how the books have changed in in 32 books in however yeah. many years. We don't know. But yeah, I guess this week I have to pose a theory, and I'm torn herds between posing what I think is the actual theory or my misappropriation of facts, and I I feel like even though I'd love to just get my theory out of the way and see how correct I am in the Mm, end, mm -hmm. I'm also horrifically scared that'll close off any opportunity to talk about the extra clues we're presented next week. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that because obviously the way that this story is structured, right? Every chapter is very deliberate. Every yeah. paragraph, every section, like we cut directly to Brother Edolf on the boat. Like I am Saxon man coming from far away. I will need someone who understands murder mystery to pair <laughs> with me. Like everything is very, very clear what the intent is. Yeah. But um, but the way this mystery is, is set up, right? We've got the synod going on at the time that the murder is reported mm-hmm. and Sister Athel Swift, which is a great name, Apparently, she reports the time of the death of Sister Etain uh, of Kildare, yes. who knows Fidelma personally. Um, and Athelswith says, you know, I saw seven people come to her room throughout the day. You should probably investigate them. So there's all these characters, some of which we haven't even seen yet, who, you know, mm. may or may not be the killers. Um, obviously, we've only seen them with human eyes. Who knows who could have slipped in between? Yeah. But that that's what we're given. We're given this sort of list here. I think- the interesting thing that I'm going to play up mm. is the idea that Peter Tremaine has set this in an event in history. I was shuffled over to look at King Oswy of Northumbria, the only person who could get away with pulling a murder off in history and sweeping it under the rug would be the person in power. Fidelma makes a big deal out of finding the truth. Are you saying that she's going to find out the truth and crumble under the weight of the responsibility? Are you saying that she won't find out? What do you think? No, I I, I think she's going to be unable to do something about it would be the the lens that I take. Mm. I don't expect these things to be true because especially in detective fiction, we kind of rarely question our detective sense of morals because it's kind of ascribed to them that they are the most righteous by their allocation of the detective. Well, there is that thorn of the romance. I don't know if you think that Adolf might have something to do with concealing clues from her or perhaps her judgment will be tainted by that, that sort of angle. I don't know. 
Yeah, it, it's it's tough to say because I don't think there's much in the way of clues so much as just speculation to see sure, what will sure. happen in the end. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that the whole setup of our victim in this case, Sister Attain, who was going to take Sister Attain's hand in marriage. I was going to ask, this is definitely one of those those aspects of the mystery yeah. that you need to kind of pursue. Who, who do you think it was? Do you think it's- I want to say that it has to be- the first of Oswe's sons who was introduced. Okay. Uh, like, you know, Ulfrith doesn't really seem to fit because he's a follower of Rome. Sure. And, uh, oh my goodness. I'm looking down our I mean, list of characters es- that we Eskrith, have prepared for this. S- son of Inflade, the queen, <laughs> who is the third wife of Oswe. I think that's who I was looking for, but my brain is like switching off looking at all of these character names side by side. You think that Eskrith might be the um i think so i think that it's probably some level of turmoil uh with his mother and okay. uh and his father and like a, a disagreement in the the oswe clan I, I do think though that because we do get the whole setup of her throat having been slit while attain had her yes. headdress off that mm. it has to be her lover that okay. that did her in uh, mm. So if I'm going to pin this on Ekrif, Ek Griff, E C Griff, E C Griff, Yo E C Griff in the house. Uh, then, <laughs> then I, I have to say that they are lovers and sure. they they were done in over their political differences related like to this it. marriage. Pinning the murder on a character that hasn't really appeared in the story at all. I love it. It's perfect. It's it's a challenge. It's a challenge because I know I'm wrong. I know I'm wrong. <laughs> no, you don't know. Can I tell you what I would have picked? I would have gone the opposite route because obviously you've tried to valiantly and I would say bravely, you've attempted to pin the murder on someone who is like a historical character or closely tied. Whereas I would have gone the opposite because there is a character here who barely has Uh a name. Kana, son of Kana, the crazy beggar who said there's going to be an eclipse tomorrow and someone's going (laughs) to die. Maybe he's doing all of this and he's killed Sister Attain so that he can be known as the person who prophesies like a real event at the Synod. He wants to go down in history. Mm. And obviously that's his tragedy is that he is responsible for the murder. But by the end of the book, Fidelma knows like we can never let this get out because he would go down in history just like he wants to. So we know the truth, but history will never know the truth. This idiot beggar, this like astromancy Damn, If only I was as good at you at coming up with bad <laughs> theories. <laughs> if only, if only you had the clever uh, foresight that I have to understand <laughs> why this beggar is the obvious like fall man. I do love that idea that like the the juxtaposition between the very serious historical account. And some dude just mm-hmm. wanting to toot his own horn. Yeah. Like, it's great. <laughs> like that being the accompanying murder is such a ridiculous Look, idea. Honestly, I would love if that were the conclusion to this book. I'm either confirming <laughs> or denying. Maybe I'm just telling you exactly what's Maybe going you on. Maybe you don't even know. You Maybe even this know. is part of the answer that you know I, I haven't quite gotten to yet. <laughs> well, we'll have to see uh, come next week because I'm I'm sure that you'll be able to figure most things out by then. Yeah. Now, I will say there are- Shout out to Sappho and her friend. <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> so there there are four points on the table. Obviously, you, you pose two separate theories. You get one. You get most things right. I'll give you yep. one or two. We'll, we'll sort that out <laughs> next week. But- I wanted to put one point on something. I want you to think about this as you're reading the next series of chapters. Do you want me to, do you want me to answer this today? No, and no, no, then no, no. Think no. About I, do, I explicitly do not want you to answer today. I want you to mull it over. Okay. Read the book because I want you to look into the heart of the king and tell mm-hmm. me why he comes to the decision that he does. Because in real history, like- Oswe, king of Northumbria, he he does, spoilers, side with Rome because that's the way the wind's blowing. Yeah. Figure out why he makes a decision he does and his mindset as he comes to that decision. That's as vague as I want to be with you because I, I, just want you, I just want you to like read this character, try and figure him out because we know I love yeah. a good character study. I want you to study King Oswe. 
as best you can and come up with a theory for why he does what he does at the end of the book. This is a cool one. I like this challenge, Herds. Thank you for giving it to me. Well, you're very welcome. I'm sure you'll have no trouble again. This is an attempt by good old Peter mm. to marry like this compelling story and the themes that he's interested in exploring with a real historical event. So if you are able to effectively figure out King Oswe's mindset, I'd say that Peter has done his job. Otherwise, we will condemn him as only a very good author and not a perfect one, which <laughs> is the worst crime I can bestow upon him. Um, uh, <laughs> that said, tragic. we will tragic. be covering for next week chapters 8 to 12 for the second part of our journey. And I hope that you'll have a foolproof theory, possibly involving poetry, uh, for the next time we, we can join. I'm excited for it, Flex. <laughs> You're listening to Death of the Reader. We are Flex and Herds here for your Murder Mystery World Tour. Back with those chapters next week on the show. We are discussing Absolution by Murder by Peter Tremaine. We'll see you then. <laughs> <laughs>